Hi everyone, welcome to our session on how to become an oceanographer. My name is Sarah Taylor. I am an environmental economist here at the National Oceanography Center. I'm here with an amazing and inspiring panel of scientists who I'm really eager to engage with. So thank you for joining today. We're going to hear a bit more about themselves and as well as their journey into ocean science. So to kickstart the session, I'm going to ask you all to please introduce yourselves and give us a brief overview of a day in the life of your job. We can start with you, Alice. Hi, I'm Alice, and I work with both computer models of the ocean, but also with measurements that we take directly in the ocean. And on a daily basis, I might be sitting at my computer looking at these models of the ocean, but sometimes I'll be at sea on a ship actually taking these observations directly. Uh, I'm Alejandro Sanchez Franks. I'm in the Marine Physics and Ocean Climate Group. I'm interested in large scale circulation, mostly from observations. Um, and all the observational programs we had here. Uh, similar to Alice, um, a regular day might consist of looking at the data that we have of the ocean, normally physical parameters like temperature, salinity, pressure, and trying to understand what that means, how things have changed. And uh, at some point uh, you might find us at sea. I'm Elisa and I work uh, at the interface between ocean biogeochemistry and physics. I mostly work at the computer, so a typical day is actually uh, working at the computer, uh, but I do work both with models and observations. Uh, I'm John McQuillan. Uh, I work in the Ocean Technology and Engineering Group as a, a molecular biologist, but also um, integrated with the, the engineering side of things as well. Um, we deliver sensors for um, onboard vehicles like the boat, even boat based summary. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's lovely to have such a wide range of expertise with us in the room. Um, you could hear about your journey towards your specialization and how you ended up here in your career. So Alice, I know you changed degrees at one point. Can you tell us a little bit more about your journey? Yeah, so I think sometimes we have to make these decisions a bit too early in life when we don't really know yet what we want to do. So actually my first degree um, after college was in biomedical engineering, which probably sounds quite different than it was. Uh, I simply realized it wasn't for me. And so I switched to environmental sciences and there I took a course in meteorology and oceanography, did an internship with the environmental agency there. And so that is how I got into oceanography and then did a PhD in climate science, so on and eventually ended up here. Amazing. And you started off studying in Italy, right? You kind of studied all over. Yes. So I did my undergraduate studies in Italy. Then I did my master's actually here in Southampton. Mm -hmm. Then I did my PhD in Bristol, um, a postdoc in the US, oh, wow. and eventually I realized that this is where I wanted mm -hmm. to come back to. Amazing, so a lot of traveling. <laughs> yeah. Great. And John, at one point you had a choice to specialize in medical or environmental biology. How did you manage this at the time to choose and how did this impact the rest of your journey into your job? Yeah, that's right. So I started off in medical sciences and I was interested in diagnosing diseases. So that means knowing where disease causing organisms come from. Um, and then I found out early on in my career that actually a lot of the origins of disease are the environment and people pick things up from coastal regions and, and so on. Um, so that moved me into the environmental sciences by looking at how we spot disease causing organisms early on before they've actually reached the, the clinic. That's very interesting. And Ale, how about you? What attracted you to ocean sciences specifically? It's the age old cliche. I love the ocean, grew up <laughs> next to the ocean, um, but also, uh, I actually didn't even know that oceanography was a career path until, you know, I think I was about to finish university when I realized this was an option. And I'd done my undergraduate in applied math and I was really interested in global warming, climate change, and you know, what, what I could do to, to be a part of that. And um, because I had this uh, heavy math physics background and I was really interested in, in, in climate, it kind of just fit to do grad studies in, in marine physics. That's great. And you, Alyssa, what, what happened in your journey to get there? Yeah, so for me, uh, it's a bit similar, even though at the beginning I was a mountain person, so I wasn't really into the ocean, even though I grew up on the ocean. But as soon as I moved away, I became, I felt the need to go back to it. Uh, so what really, really fascinates me about the ocean is this interplay between physics and biology. So the fact that physics really, really uh, influences life in the ocean, and the ocean is this 3D a big world, kind of hidden world, because it's very difficult to see what happens under the surface. And it covers most of the planet. 
and in, in the ocean, uh, everything is brought around, nutrients, even living beings are uh, circulated basically by the currents. Uh, so it's a very dynamic living world. Great. Yeah, and I suppose a lot of that, as you said, it's very dynamic, a lot is unknown, and there's obviously, I'm sure, a lot of challenges in each of your line of work. Um, have you experienced any specific challenges? And maybe if you could particularly talk to your experience um, through doing your PhD, if you maybe have any advice for listeners who are thinking about doing a PhD or currently in one. Yeah, I think the PhD is a very particular stage of career, uh, possibly a difficult one, because uh, one is in these intermediate position. So you're a student on the one side, but then your science, you actually have to publish and your science is judged as if you're an expert by other experts, right? So um, what's a bit challenging of during the PhD is to put together these two parts of the experience, being a student and becoming an expert and learning basically your job while you are already interfacing yourself with experts. Uh, so my suggestion to anyone that uh, is about to start a PhD, for example, uh, is really to choose well the, the subject because it's going to be intense, like you will really learn. And maybe it's a unique opportunity to really dig into a subject to that level because it will be a long project and you will know so much at the end of the PhD about this subject. And also, also choose very well the people you will work with. Uh, it's really important. I think the environment in which you will develop your PhD is really important for uh, your enjoyment also of the experience. That's really good advice. And John, what about you? Have you faced some challenges in your job and has there any, been anything in particular that has surprised you about working within ocean science? Uh, yeah, I mean, it can be very challenging. Um, I mean, science is, it can be hard work. Um, one of the things about doing a, a PhD and then early career work is that it's at the sort of time of life where uh, maybe you're occupied with other things as well you know it's uh, to be when you're looking towards maybe buying a house settling down that kind of thing as well so um, it can be stressful um, in a session early today we were talking about it's important to let your curiosity uh, motivate you and, and guide you through that and, and uh, to, to get you through the, the hard parts um, and it can also be very challenging um, in terms of uh, delivering high level science when you're a junior researcher as well because you are judged as a scientist people don't always make concessions for the fact you're, you're still a student or at an early level of your career um so yeah i think in that way as i said if you let your interest and your your curiosity push you through that then it's a rewarding career in the end that's great and um the interest and curiosity you speak of um do you feel like that has impacted your day-to-day -day life or your habits at all in life uh, yeah, it's certainly, um, it's a job where you kind of, you live your job a little bit more. Uh, it's not a nine to five job. Um, and it's something where uh, if you're happy at the end of the day, picking up some more reading or some more, some more work related things, um, I think that certainly helps you as a scientist, helps you to stay on the, the, the cutting edge. Um, yeah, it certainly means that you, you kind of end up living your job um, a little bit more than maybe in some other professions. Yeah. And what about you, Alice? I know specifically you love scuba diving and that's kind of been intertwined in your story, right? I'd love to hear more about that as well as if um, any visual representation of seeing how the ocean has changed over time throughout your life, has that impacted your life in any way? Um, yeah, I guess, so I started scuba diving really early before I even ever had a degree because I come from a family of scuba divers. So my dad was just taking me down with this little tank to look at the fish. Um, and I remember when I first actually started, we would go to some locations and when we would come out, my dad was like, oh my God, it's just crazy to see how we needed to get to, I don't know, down to 30 meters to see the same bright colors or those same corals and species that a few years ago we could see a much shallower depth. And I guess at the time I didn't quite get exactly what that meant, but I over time started seeing these differences and, and now I guess I know that this is linked to climate and changes that I'm now understanding better. And in terms of changes in my life, I suppose we're just a bit more aware and because of the profession and the job that we do and we just try to think what's that little bit that we can all do to contribute to the bigger picture, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. And what um, research are you busy engaging in at the moment? At the moment, I'm doing a mix of things. So some of it has to do with um, the heat that is getting into the ocean from the atmosphere and how this is moved around and what are the processes 
causing that. I think that's something that Ale works on as well, for example. Uh, and the other things I'm looking at are uh, mostly um, high latitudes, so in particular the Southern Ocean, and I'm working with a student looking at data coming from satellites and in situ observations in the Southern Ocean and related to changes in sea ice. Oh, that's really interesting. And John, how about you? What do you, are you currently working on? And also in the future, where would you like to, to take your research spe um, specifically around sensor that would be great to hear more about that? Yeah, so at the moment, so I'm focused on uh, new methods for detecting some of the microorganisms which cause problems either through disease or through contaminating our food. Um, and what's interesting about that is it's it's sort of twofold. One part is developing the new methods and the other part is integrating those with some of the technology which at NOC is world leading. Um, so at the moment, what I'm really focused on is trying to put those methods onto the NOC's platforms um, and then uh, in extension to that and deploying those platforms uh, for industry applications. So it, obviously it's, it's no good just sitting in the lab and doing science for science sake. We want to be able to help people make the world a better place. Um, so another part of my work at the moment is, is focusing on engaging with those people who are going to be using the technology going forward. And what are some examples of those end users who use the technology and, and what for on a stereotypical basis? Um, so a lot of the work is based on something called harmful algal blooms, um, big phytoplankton populations which produce toxins and these contaminate our food, including shellfish. Um, so some of the end users I've been working with include people like the um, Port Health Authorities, um, and the regulators, the people who do the statutory testing to ensure that our food is safe to eat. And uh, researching more about that and hearing about the, the toxins, has that impacted the way that you consume any seafood at all? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I think in the UK, especially, we're, we're really hot on um, uh, controlling that and managing events where there may be some contamination. So it doesn't actually change any of my habits. Um, I think what's important is that we need to stay on top of it, we need to be vigilant against these things and especially with things like climate change, this is only going to increase in severity and frequency going forward as well. Um, and so what it does is it again this sort of feeds into my drive to make sure that we keep delivering the methods and the very latest technology to, to ensure we can do that. Yeah, that's great. It's, um interesting because there is a lot of research right at the moment that is kind of suggesting that the ocean is going to be where we turn to to feed the growing population so what are your thoughts on that do you feel like our technology will be able to help mitigate these risks with toxins and moving forward or what are your thoughts yeah i mean hopefully i mean a, a big part of that is obviously we need to keep everything regulated so if food production is going to expand into the oceans and there's a chance there that it sort of becomes a little bit out of control and and then we've had issues before with um uh, foraging people people foraging for food and becoming sick because they're picking uh, seafood um shellfish for example which have been contaminated and they haven't gone through the proper industry checks and everything um so yeah i mean it's, it's really important going forward a lot of the technology is i wouldn't say designed to replace people but it's designed to reduce the um, labor and uh, logistical cost of um, being able to do this widespread monitoring um so that's going to help as we expand with with food production to make sure we can keep everybody safe yeah that's very really interesting um, and Ellie, I'd love to hear more about your favourite parts of your job and um, any really cool experiences you've had in your line of work. Um, so I think one of the coolest things, I don't think I realised uh, when I got into science, essentially, is how much we still don't know. Mm. I think it's easy to think that a lot's been figured out or, you know, we have a pretty good idea of what's happening. One of the most sort of shocking but also quite interesting things is how much we don't know about the ocean. Um, it's a really new field, actually, um, and we were talking in an earlier panel discussion about some of our observing systems and how new they are. You know, we're com they're discovering completely new processes that we didn't know before about the ocean, and that contributes to this sort of sense of being a pioneer, and there's so much to discover still, and how much we don't know, and all these ideas of what we could do and what we don't understand, and how that all fits into the system. And so that's that, for me, is sort of a, a really big big motivator for continuing in this field. And another really exciting aspect is, um, is well, the field work we do. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And if, you know, if anyone ever comes across that experience, you know, absolutely take it. It's really good. Although um, obviously there's, there's some people that it's, it's a bit more mind. Some people don't like it and they never want to do it again. <laughs> and some people love it and they're, you know, basically chase after it their whole lives. And, you know, when you're at sea and, you know, you, you really can't see the coast and you're out there for six weeks, it's, you know, it's like being on another planet. It's really incredible. 
And um, is there an average length to these kind of field trips? I suppose it depends on the study, but what is the stereotypical length as well as maybe a bit of an insight into day-to-day life on the boat? Sure, so there's loads of different types of field work from coastal to deep ocean. Um, I do mostly deep ocean stuff. So the type of cruises that I go on might last six weeks. We'll cross an ocean basin to get a sense of what uh, the large scale circulation is because we're looking at those very large scale processes over long periods of time. So a lot of the global programs that do these sort of types of field work and large scale circulation, what they really want to assess is what is the decadal change over time? So they might be run every five years, every 10 years, And we build these records um, that go on for decades and they're global and various countries, uh, you know, participate and feed into it. So so that's just one type of field work. There are are many other different types. And so in a kind of day to day um, and even even within that, there's a lot of sub kind of different subtypes of of expeditions. But in a day to day of the sort of thing that I've done, um, I'll tell you about the last cruise I did, which is we We were doing a section across the North Atlantic and we left from Florida and, uh, you know, took six weeks to sail all the way to the Canaries to get that entire section across the Atlantic. And what we wanted to know was to get a very high resolution section to get a sense of the circulation north and south of that and to know how much that changes. The large scale system of currents that is most important in the North Atlantic um, can be sampled at that point. And that was kind of really what we were going for. And day to day, it's really just, I mean, it's 12 hour days of putting instruments in the water. It's very slow going, putting instruments in the water, wait six hours, pull them back out, you know, this kind of thing. And we did about, so for each one, we'll, we'll drop um, sort of a line of instruments. We did about 130 across the Atlantic last time. And this was right before the pandemic started. So it was one of the last cruises that we did from the UK. Oh, wow. And Alice, you also do field work, right? And you go yeah. on ships. Uh, what has your experience been like? Any notable memories? Uh, yeah, well, actually, the last cruise I went on was one of the very few that happened right in the middle of the pandemic. So actually, last year, right as the UK was getting into another lockdown, we flew down to the Falkland Islands and spent a couple of months around the Southern Ocean. So there were a lot of challenges because normally, like these cruises that also Ali is talking about quite often, There's quite a few of us who contribute, scientists and technicians. This one, because of all the logistics, it was very restricted numbers. So sometimes it was more fast paced than usual. And I guess something quite cool about that, um, maybe you've heard it in the news about this big iceberg that was wandering around the Southern Ocean last year. So that is one of the things that we uh, opportunistically tried to get additional uh, data for. And I have to say that when we first saw the iceberg, it was just almost less impressive than you would think, (laughs) basically because it was so big that there was no way you could get an idea of the scale. So you just saw this thing covering the entire horizon and and thought, it must be really big, but (laughs) I guess you can only really see it if you have pictures with the ship for scale and you realize how enormous that was and, you know, penguins, whales. And lots of other exciting things. So we are quite lucky. Yeah. It's amazing. I need to figure out how to be able to scale on one of these trips as a, an economist. Do you need one of them? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. yeah. And um, Alyssa, I'd love to hear a bit more about the current research you're doing as well as what you want to move into in the future. Any specific topics you're looking at at the moment? Uh, yeah, so uh, recently, basically, I started to work with observations. In my past, I worked more with models. Uh, I started to work with glider data and I'm working and yeah, I'm looking at oxygen in the ocean and I find it extremely fascinating and both using glider data because you can actually see um, very fine scale processes in the ocean that uh, you cannot easily see with uh, older type of measurements and you can compare it with models. So it, you even see more, I would say, than in a model because a model will have a certain resolution where the glider data can actually span almost let's say uh, they continue. So it's very, very interesting data to look at. Uh, Oxygen is a very interesting topic. Um, It's very hot in ocean sciences because we are seeing that the ocean is likely losing oxygen in time. So um, I'm hoping to uh, work on oxygen in the ocean more and also going back to integrating model data into, into my research. 
And for listeners who may not understand or know, can you describe briefly what a glider is? And I'd also love to hear, um, with you speaking about oxygen levels dropping in the ocean, what can that mean for maybe an everyday human? And what does that, how does that impact our lives um, as well as the ocean? So a glider is um, like a um, tiny yellow torpedo. Does that make sense? With <laughs> wings uh, that can be, let's say, dropped in the ocean. I'm not an observation based, let's say, person. I, I use the data uh, as a user, but I didn't collect the data. But anyways, um, I can try to describe what it is. So it's this instrument uh, that is, it looks like a, a yellow torpedo. You put it in, or a yellow airplane, tiny airplane. You put it in the ocean and it will basically uh, continuously sample the ocean while moving up and down from the surface to up to, the data I have is a kilometer into the ocean, so a thousand meters deep, mm -hmm. and it can do this several times a day. So several times a day, this tiny yellow airplane, I mean, it's some meters, uh, will go down to a thousand meters and come up again, and then continuously do this for months. So, and it collects really high resolution data on like 20 centimeters. Wow. Resolution is really a lot mm -hmm. of data. And then at the end, it, you, you recover it, and on, the, on these, uh, instrument, there were sensors that could measure temperature, salinity, oxygen, for example. Uh, I know there are new sensors that are being developed for um, nutrients. I mean, there are some that are already used, there are some new ones coming, so it's a very uh, new field. Also, looking at this data is pretty new, so they have been started uh, to be used recently. Um, so uh, th there is a lot of potential and uh, they're, I think they're going to be used more in the future. Um, in terms of the importance of oxygen, um, the issue, I would say the, the easiest thing to think about is that if you're in the ocean, uh, let's just think about fisheries. It's the easiest and most, I think, uh, 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 direct consequence that I can think about. If you are a fish in the ocean, you need to breathe. If you can't breathe, you die, simply, as simple as that. So uh, what's been seen is that uh, due to a series of changes connected with climate change, uh, the oxygen concentration in the ocean is going lower, especially in some coastal areas that are especially rich in fish. And this can cause mass death of fish. Mm -hmm. And it can really affect fisheries. Uh, it can change basically the economy on which several countries survive mm -hmm. because they go fishing and uh, if the fishery is collapsed because oxygen is too low and fish literally chokes, once you don't have, once you can't breathe, you can't breathe, right? So it's a, it's a really like fundamental uh, type of variable to look at. And uh, we're trying to understand better how it will change in the future. It's probably not gonna change the same way everywhere. So it's really important to look at it on the small scale as well. Interesting. And just your um, thoughts and I don't know if all of you maybe have opinions on this. Um, there seems to be quite a divide between going into models or observations, right? Or you can think both. Um, and what is your advice to people who may be wanting to look at going into either or with the sort of strengths and weaknesses of both of those fields of science? Any ideas? I mean, sooner or later, you have to do both. Okay. It's yeah. basically the, the long and the short of it. Um, you can come at it from the observation side, but we're very limited with the amount of observations that we have in the ocean. So at some point you might be asking questions that require um, looking at a model to kind of get a sense of the bigger picture, or you might be coming in from the modeling side and you know being able to do basically just anything because model has coverage everywhere, but then needing to validate um, and ground truthing the model with the observations. That's kind of my two cents. I agree. And actually I think it's great to have people who are specifically experts in both, but also what we are realizing is that what we need is people who are a bit more able to speak both languages, let's say, and so be able to be at the interface of both. And I think, for example, like Elisa is a bit more at the interface of physics and biology and biogeochemistry in some ways. That's the kind of goal I set for myself a few years ago. I was like, okay, when I grow up, I want to be someone who works both with models and observations, but actually go and collect them, understand them, and be able to talk to both worlds, even though sometimes maybe I feel like I'm not enough of an expert in both, but that's okay. There are other people around to help. Yeah. 
yeah and i think uh, collaborations between yeah. people that work in the different fields are really really essential like uh like really talking with people that are specialists in one or the other uh is really uh important so to maintain these uh uh cross-disciplinary approach i think especially in oceanography is really fundamental to to help each other because in the end models and observations they feed into each other so the the model without observations it cannot be validated it, we couldn't know whether the model is doing something random or it's doing something close to reality and on the other side once you have the model you can possibly identify processes that you want to understand better and then you go up to observe them so they really feed into each other continuously yeah i think that's a really interesting point that you mentioned there also um, around interdisciplinary research and i think um i wish i could have gone back to when i was in university and understand and have the foresight to see that there will be a lot more collaboration especially within disciplines so the fact that i'm an economist here working at the oceanography center i never even imagined that would be possible so it's really great and i think for, for listeners who are maybe confused about which field to go in. It's really lovely to see that the research world is opening up to look at finding solutions with um, through collaboration, which I think is really important. Um, I'd love to slowly start to close off with um, just any words of wisdom about, you know, if you had to speak to 16 year old you, what would you have to say? <laughs> um, well, I like I said before, you know, don't be scared of making, let's call it the wrong decision because it's never going to be a waste of time. Like I said, I changed degrees, but things that I learned in that degrees, like programming ended up shaping my, you know, my future degrees. And so I definitely don't consider that as wasted time. So, you know, keep your options open. So I think Alex, Alex's example was very good. So she had this really good background in maths and physics. And from that, she could do anything. But so, yeah, 16 year old me, yeah, pick something that you like and interests you because you'll make your life a lot easier, I guess, <laughs> if you do that, whatever that ends up being. Yeah. Um, 16 year old me wanted to be an architect. <laughs> um, I think if I could go back now and say something, it would be, I didn't realize, you know, earlier on how many opportunities there was, you know, before you make that, that commitment that we've talked about choos choosing a field, maybe choosing to go into grad studies, there's actually an enormous amount of opportunities of finding out what it would be like to be in the field or taking part of a research expedition or even coming to events like this. And I, I wasn't aware that these kinds of things existed. So I think that would be my main advice to myself that, you know, to go out and look for the opportunities um, to just see what, what the experience is like. If I could speak to 16 year old me, I would tell her two things. One is follow your dreams, follow what you like. Uh, I also switched field a few times during my career and in the end it was useful actually. So I could gain more experience with different approaches. Uh, and the second thing would be, don't be scared of failing. Uh, so I was, as a 16 year old at high school, I was having a pretty easy time actually with school. So I was used to just like, you know, go through it. It was relatively, straightforward for me. And then I arrived at university and things were different. Uh, there were way more people, a huge environment. And then the same during the PhD, things got quite complicated at times. And it was difficult for me because I wasn't used to it. And I wasn't used to failing. And failing is part of life. And I think it's important to accept that. And that's also how research works. So research actually works through trying. And then if it doesn't work, you will find another approach, you will find uh, a different method, but it happens to fail and it's just part of it. And uh, yeah, as a, as a funny note, in my uh, PhD um, office, me and my PhD mates had this whiteboard and we wrote on it, it's called research, not search. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called research, because <laughs> you will fail at it. <laughs> That's a really good point, thank you, Sherry. So I think in a nutshell, I'd probably say um, find something you really love doing in science technology because it does get hard at times and that will drive you through. Uh, but I think also um, I would go back and I would probably try and focus more on the core disciplines first before going straight into what I really want to do. So maths, physics, biology, chemistry, the hard subjects, right? Um, because then in my experience, at least, I found it much easier to then apply that to the specifics of the subject that I really want to do. 
um, rather than try and go into the interesting bit and then go back and do the, the hard stuff later on. Great, thank you so much for sharing that advice. Um, I'd love to move to some Q&A um, if we have. I have um, a question coming from Lyons so from Georgia 87. Uh, she asks, what can a um, young people do to learn more about the ocean? Any ideas? <laughs> well, I guess the fact that they're here is already a very good start. Um, I suppose reading, I think um, there's a lot of good evolving literature in the field. I guess, as Ali pointed out, it's oceanography is sort of a new field. So actually these better books for all ages are slowly coming up. I wish I had a specific suggestion. I can't think of anything in case someone else does. There's actually, uh, there's a lot of outreach and engagement now. Uh, for example, I recently contributed to something called 30 Second Oceans, uh, which is a very short book uh, with, you know, the sort of 30 second idea on different key pieces of ocean information. But more and more now there, you know, if you search online, there's databases and repositories um, and make sure that they're affiliated to a university or some scientific institution that do these really good engagement pieces that are very short sort of bite-sized pieces of information on, you know, like key parts of information or key discoveries and just, you know, how, how the field is evolving. And just before we move on though, there's, there's plenty of content on the platform, including podcasts. So stay tuned for uh, future coming um, podcasts. Uh, a question from the audience. Um, yeah, so just a lot of early career professionals and uh, people at university maybe new that want to get involved in ocean science and get experience, who are often faced with these barriers of having to pay to get this experience. Um, what's your advice to kind of find ways of getting involved in ocean science and gaining these, these experiences without having that barrier of having to pay uh, to do those? It's, it's unfortunate. It's, 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 it's part of the, the way the, the world is that you know some some very talented people might be precluded because there's a there's a big cost, especially in in terms of postgraduate study. Um, I mean, there are studentships and, and things which are available and they're usually an open competition. Um, and there's a lot of uh, material now which is available free of charge online. You know, there's, there's a lot more information than there used to be. I remember being at university and the textbook costs were just like astronomical and it made it very difficult to actually learn anything. Obviously nowadays it's slightly different because there's other sources of information. Um, so hopefully that will be of some benefit to, to people struggling to, to fund their route through. And I guess one, it's not always going to be possible, but maybe I'd say try and look local. So obviously it sounds exciting to go and look at corals somewhere tropical or counting turtles on the beach. But for example, in my undergrad, I managed to do this great internship just with the environmental agency that was 20 minutes from where I was studying and living. And that is really, as I can't remember who was saying that, probably Ale, like, that's what showed me that is actually a profession that is something you can do and it was it was really fun I was waking up like at 5 a.m or something but and going out in the winter in terrible conditions but I was like yeah I guess I can do it and so that's my suggestion I guess um, so I'm a first year PhD student and I know you touched on this already a little bit but I'm really excited I'm also really really overwhelmed when you kind of first enter into higher academia, you become very aware of everything you don't know and everything out there that you want to know. And it's kind of hard sometimes to maybe condense it down a little bit, even, even with your project. So I guess specifically tailored to PhD students, what advice would you give me and other students as a, a very early uh, PhD? Where to start? <laughs> I think you, uh, what I learned when I did my PhD or, or later on was that you don't need to know it all. You're, you're trying to produce a very narrow piece of research. And I think in some ways a PhD is about learning how to do research. So I, I suppose don't be overwhelmed by it. You know, we've all been there, we know what it's like. Um, and um, yeah, just I, I suppose just take it as it comes, focus on your area, 
obviously you need the broader reading as well but don't try and change the world with it i think a lot of phd students come in at the moment i have a few phd students and they're so ambitious and it's brilliant it's really refreshing to see um but they are trying to change the world and it's like you know rein it in a little bit and, and just focus on your phd then go and change the world <laughs> I think also experience comes with time and it's just a matter of being, if you want patient and curious at the same time. I mean, when I started my PhD, uh, I literally didn't even know the physics of the ocean. I studied atmospheric physics in, in my master. So I started, I didn't even, there were maps of the ocean. Someone was like, oh, that's so shallow. And I was like, shallow respect to what? I mean, I didn't know, right? So I took time and I remember when I went to the first conference, for example, I sat through many talks and I couldn't understand that it was so much information and so much technical technical information that I didn't know, right? So slowly in time, you learn your field. And that's the, I think the most exciting part, right? Learning, I mean, for me, learning is extremely exciting. And this type of job also uh, somehow forces you to continue to learn always. Also when you are an experienced scientist, if you want to continue to learn. so just go through this process accepting that you are learning and you will get there right maybe this year i mean i've been gradu i graduated in 2018 this year was the first time at a conference well there was the pandemic in the middle so i sat there and i i was like oh that's it L that like i get it it's my <laughs> field i understand i know the people you know you have a network you feel like also almost a bit at home in your field and uh grows in time, this feeling, and your understanding of the field. Um, I wanted to say something that I think, I hope, addresses both, both things that you guys have raised. Um, and one of the, the, maybe the most powerful things or the most helpful things uh, I was doing through a PhD in my first postdoc was joining early career networks. Uh, they're full of resources. Uh, you know, it can be a little bit overwhelming to go online and try and figure out, well, how do I get, you know, I, I want to go to this conference, but I don't have the funding. How do I get a bursary? You know, like connecting with other people uh, will give you loads of insight into different bursaries that you can apply for, fellowships, getting your own funding to do the kind of thing that you want, and sort of financial barriers. Um, and at the same time, it can provide a network for those other bigger questions. You know, like this is an enormous field. How do I condense this? How do I make a pathway or an inroad into what I want to do. Um, and, and related to that is if you have an opportunity to get a mentor, that, it, that can be a really instrumental thing uh, towards developing uh, your field in academia. Do you have any advice for PhD students? <laughs> um, well, I guess a point somewhat related to what Ale was saying, yeah, developing your network and you know sharing these concerns and overwhelming feelings with your peers. You know, some of it will happen at conference, but some of it will happen in your office with your office mates. And what people were telling me when I was doing my PhD, and I only realized a few years later, is that, you know, those are the people, those are the senior scientists of the future. So, you know, the people that you meet now, maybe in 10 years time, will be the ones who ring you up and say, oh, I remember you were doing this for your PhD. Why don't we collaborate on these great new projects? So I'd say, yeah, surround yourself with people you like working with and it will be all good. <laughs> I think what is it called? Imposter syndrome, right? Is <laughs> Am I supposed to be here? <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for all the questions and for joining and thank you for joining me today. It was really interesting to hear about your journeys. You guys are all very inspiring and I'm really lucky to, to work in this building with you all. Thank you so much for joining our session and we look forward to engaging with you in the future.